opportunity to come. And God, just to come and receive from your word. And Lord, we just thank you that uh, you are the one who holds the words of eternal life. And so, Lord, we just come. We just, we just want our ears. We want our hearts, God, to be open to, God, what you're saying, what you're speaking to us this morning. So, Lord, we bless you this morning. We just give you thanks for every good thing, for we know it all comes from you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, as you know, uh, Pastor Travis has been ministering on the, the mending of the nets, the casting of the nets, and um, <clears throat> about the, what is it, the curious who come to sit at the table. They're all, they're all about uh, coming for the meal, and about the connected and the committed and the catalyst. Oh, I'm glad I hesitated because some of you jumped in there, so that's good to know you're listening. I just felt this morning to, uh, to minister on uh, getting in the boat and getting out of the boat. And uh, we're going to turn to Matthew chapter 14 here, and I think Brian's going to bring that up on the screen for us. There we are. And uh, I just want to go through this, just read this to, to kind of start off about... Um, this whole thing about Peter and the disciples and them meeting Jesus uh, walking on the water. So here we go. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. Well, he sent the multitudes away. And when he sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now, when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now, in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost, and they cried out for fear. But immediately, Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him <clears throat> and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Interesting. So he said, Come. And when Peter had come down of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand. He caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came, and they worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. And when they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret. So we see this uh, scripture verse here about Jesus meeting the disciples. He goes out walking to them on the water in Matthew chapter 14. And we're also going to be pulling a little bit out of John chapter 6 and Mark chapter 6 because we see uh, the same story there. And there's just a couple other details to the whole story that, that really... Um, adds to the whole thing. You know, we start out here, and, uh, and I'm going to actually jump now to, to Matthew, or sorry, Mark chapter 6. And uh, maybe Brian's got that too. Mark chapter 6, where we see this. And in verse 45, it says, immediately. So what happened here is just before this, we've had the feeding of the 5,000. So the disciples have, have seen, uh, you know, incredible miracle unfold before them. All the people have seen this incredible miracle that Jesus does by feeding 5,000 people with only five loaves and two fish. <laughs> I was trying to remember this five loaves or two fish. But um, <clears throat> so they've seen this great miracle. And then it says immediately he, Jesus, made them get into the disciples to get into the boat and go before them to the other side, to Bethsaida, where he sent them, well, he sent the multitude away. So why are they in the boat? They're in the boat because Jesus made them get in the boat. And in fact, the, the original language there says that he strongly urged them. So there was a strong urging, you know, to get in the boat, to head to the other side. Now, how many of you know, am I sounding dry already? <laughs> um. How many of you know when you set out to do something, there's a lot of stuff that often happens in between, right? Amen. So you're with me on that. You know, and, and that's so true. It's, it's like God puts something in your heart, and, and you say, God, okay, I'm, I'm going to go in this direction. This is, this is where you've directed me to go. And then all this stuff starts happening. Amen? And, but they're in the boat 
because Jesus told them to get in the boat. And as you know, as this story unfolds, uh, somebody gets out of the boat. And one thing we have to realize is that when, when the Lord speaks something to us, that we don't get stuck on one thing. And I think that's part of, that's part of what I receive out of this and part of what I want to share this morning is, is not to get uh, stuck on one thing. But first he said, so he, they're getting in the boat because he told them to get into the boat. The next thing, it's, it says here in Mark uh, verse 45 that I read to you there. We have it up there. Uh, verse 45, sorry, where you were. Uh, he put them in the boat to go before him to the other side. Now, I don't know about you, but lots of times when we're praying, we're praying, Lord, go before me. Go before us in this thing that we're about to do. But here, Jesus, he's sending them to go before him. And, you know, the thing is, is so often I find <clears throat> is another place where we get stuck. You know, we're always praying, you know, God, it's all, it's all about me. God, go before me. Go, you know, help me in this, help me in that. And that's a good thing. I don't want to discourage anybody this morning from praying that prayer because we need to pray that prayer. But the thing is, is there's times when the Lord wants you to go before him. And I think he wants you to go before him so that he can go before you, so that you can go before him, so that he can go before you. You see, there's this walking thing that happens. It's, it's like you work and you walk together. And, and there's times, too, where... Uh, we know the disciples were encouraged. He sent them out two by two. It, it says <clears throat> to go into the cities where he was about to go. Because when you go out with what God has already done in you, with the deposit he's already put in you, then that prepares the way for Jesus to do something else in the hearts of those people. And that's why God is sending you and I out uh, where we are in our workplaces and all those sort of things is because it's in that place. It's, it's when you share what you have and what God's already done in your life, you're preparing the next thing that Jesus wants to do in those people's lives and also in your own life. Amen. Amen. Okay. Um, so here we are. We're going before Jesus. He sent us out. He's given us vision. This is the direction we're going in. And then stuff starts happening. And uh, <clears throat> so he goes to the mountain to pray. And the disciples, they go out <clears throat> um, and start rowing. And in John chapter 6, uh, we find there, it says, Now we, when evening had come, his disciples went down to the sea and it was already dark, it says, when they started out. And, yeah, you can keep going. Sorry, Brian. It was already dark, and uh, Jesus has not yet come to them. And then the sea arose because there was a great wind blowing. And they rode about three or four miles, okay, and in the original it says 25 to 30 stadia. So these guys, they've, 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 Worked pretty hard here, and we find in, in Mark uh, chapter 6, it, it says they're straining at the oars because the wind, it's, it's, it's really quite an incredible windstorm, and it's against them. It says the wind is against them. So he sent them out to head over to Bethsaida to go before him to the other side, and then stuff starts happening. And I'm sure a lot of you here can identify with that reality that when God calls us, and as Pastor Travis has been encouraging us to go about, you know, mending nets and casting nets and going out um, to be witnesses and to touch other people's lives, and as we work together here as, as a family, as a church, you know, to try and touch our city for God, this stuff happens. It happens, it happens within, amongst us, and it happens out there as you're trying to, you know, touch and, and reach people in their lives. And so these guys are straining at the oars, and they're out about three or four miles. They're, they're pretty much in the middle, uh, when I looked at a map, uh, in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. And I'm sure they're working up a pretty good sweat here, although they've got a nice breeze blowing, so that's probably helping them out a lot. But um, <clears throat> nonetheless, they're moving along. And so then we find that Jesus comes to them walking on the water. 
And so, yeah, it, Jesus comes to them, it says, in the fourth watch of the night, which is basically between three in the morning and six. So, you know, these guys have, have put in a good amount of time out there rowing away, fighting this wind, trying to get to the other side. And it said the disciples saw Jesus walking on the water. He comes to them walking on the water. And it says in Mark, it said, and he would have passed them by. He would have passed them by. And it's kind of an interesting phrase, but I, I really, as I look at it, I think what it means is not that Jesus didn't want to be seen, because if he didn't want them to see him, then he would have stayed further away in his walk, right? I mean, the Sea of Galilee was about, I don't know, I'm guessing it was around 10 miles or more long, and I think it was about six, seven, eight miles wide. Um, so he, he could have taken a path that was far from them. But I think what it means is, uh, is that when he's, what he's trying to do, he's, he's trying to reveal his glory. He's, he's coming past them. And we see this because they cry out in fear. They think that they've seen a ghost. They think they've seen the spirit. Uh, walking on the water, which would probably be a pretty common conclusion because they've never seen anybody walking on water before. And so they cry out in their fear, and Jesus responds and says, Be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. And in the original, when he says, It is I, it means I am. And we've heard that phrase before in Exodus um, when Moses is interacting with God on Mount Sinai, and he says, who shall I say has sent me? He, he says, I am. Tell them that I am has sent you. And that's because God, God always is, right? He always was, and he always is, and always will be in the future. But God is always, the amazing thing, God is always a God of the present. And no matter when we, all this stuff comes up in our lives, the storm starts blowing in our lives, God, he's always there in the present. And so when Jesus, when it's saying that he would have passed them by, I think it's very similar to with Moses. Moses, want, he said, I want to see your glory. Show me your glory. And so when it's saying Jesus would pass them by, it, it, really what it's referring to is he wanted to show them his glory. He wanted to give them more revelation about who it really is that they're walking with. And that's the same with you and I. God wants... Uh, continually to unfold to you and me that revelation of who he is, of how amazing he is. And so, you know, we see that declaration. He says, I am, you know, don't be afraid. And so then Peter responds and he says, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. Now, so he gets down on the boat. And it says he starts walking to Jesus on the water. And then he starts to sink. And I hear a lot of people, um, even whether it's on radio or wherever, talking about this story. And, you know, it, it's great to pick out people's mistakes. We, we learn from each other's mistakes, right? And I hope you learn from my mistakes. And I hope we learn from each other's mistakes. But the thing is, is let's not just focus on the mistakes. It, and this is one of my pet peeves, is when people are sharing this story uh, on radio or wherever, or they're, they're giving a sermon, and they're all saying, look at Peter, he sunk. But you know, yeah, he got out of the boat. I mean, give the guy a break, right? He was the only guy who got out of the boat. And you know, one thing I want to encourage you with this morning, and, and I think that we see here, is that it's okay to fail. You know, we want this to be a place here. It's okay to fail. It's okay when God says to come. He wants you to step out in something new. He wants you to get out of your comfort zone. It's okay to try and fail. But it's not okay to fail to try. Okay, let's remember that this morning. It's okay to try and fail, but it's not okay to fail to try. And... You know, this was, this was an opportunity in a sense. And I'm not going to put too much on the other disciples and why they didn't get out of the boat. But all I know is, gee, you know, Peter wanted to be there. And 
I think that Peter had an understanding. This is just me personally. But I think the reason he said, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you. And I think it's because he had some understanding of, you know, we find in Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, it says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so Peter had some understanding of this. He said, he knew, Lord, if you speak it, then I know I can put my faith in that. If you tell me to come, then I can put my faith in that and I can come. And the same for you and me. You know, if we, if we can say, Lord, if I can hear you, if I know you're saying this to me to do it, then I can put my faith in it. I can make that move. I can come. You know, again, in um, uh, what was the other one there I gave you, <laughs> Brian? Mark, uh, was it six or John six? Sorry, John six, yeah. Uh, it said, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. And then Jesus said to the 12, do you also want to go away? And Peter responds, and he said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Peter realized that the words that Jesus was speaking, it was life. You know, there's life in it. There's, there's power in that. So if he speaks it, I can put my faith in that. I can step out of the boat. You know, and so, you know, praise God for people like Peter who are willing to step out, who are willing to try. And now, he may have thought he was going to fail. And oftentimes, we can set out to do something, and we don't think there's going to be failure. But, you know, I think I've learned a few things in my course, in my journey in life, and that is I don't think there's hardly anything that I've set out to do that I haven't failed in some measure. And I've found that I just have to learn to come to a place of rest in that. You know, we all need to rest in that. You don't have to put this thing on yourself. And then this is encouragement. Sorry. Don't put this thing on yourself that you have to do it perfectly. It's okay to fail. And, and maybe, you know, if, if, if people here or if leadership here ask you, hey, we think you should step into this. I mean, you need to take that and you need to pray about it. But don't think that you're not ready for it because you don't think you're going to do it perfectly. Because we probably already know that. I think everybody here knows that, right? We're not going to do it because we're not perfect, so we're not going to do it perfectly. But it's in the stepping out, and it's by taking that step that we learn to do things more perfectly. It's stepping out in our weaknesses, and yet under the anointing, right, that we, we, we move towards perfection. But, you know, you can't steer a boat that's not moving, right? So if we're going to move forward, we have to be moving in order to steer that thing and, and to make progress. So Peter steps out of the boat. And, um, you know, the Lord knew before Peter stepped out what was going to happen, right? God knows everything before it even happens. And he could have said, look, Peter, this isn't your time. You know, just stay in the boat. Let's, let's wait till there's a calmer day when you can step out of the boat. You know, we all want that, don't we? We all want the calm, the calm day. <laughs> we all want, you know, everything to be just so-so before we step out into something. But the more I walk with the Lord, the more I learn that it's usually when it really brings you out of your comfort zone that it's like it's the right time to do it. It's like you, you just, it's that step because all of a sudden, this isn't, you realize it's just not something I'm going to do in my own strength. I, God, I need you here. <laughs> I need you. God, help me here to do this. And so it's just awesome that Jesus takes this opportunity. He says to him, come. And, and Peter, you know, thank God for, for people like Peter that step out in this. And so, you know, when you are being called to come, then take that opportunity 
Because, you know, I don't know. I don't know if Peter had any other. The scripture doesn't tell us if Peter had any other opportunities to walk on water. And, you know, Leonard Ravenhill once said something, it, it always stuck with me. He said, the opportunity of a lifetime must be seized in the lifetime of the opportunity. See, opportunities only last so long. And so you have to take hold of them when that opportunity arises. And so when, we, when God's encouraging us to step out into something, he's, he's calling us, you know, as Pastor Travis has been saying, to, to be a part of mending the nets, casting the nets. Uh, you know, there's an opportunity for all of us to, to be a part of that. And if we don't take that opportunity, then we're shortchanging ourselves. You know, it's, it's just not other people, but we shortchange what God would do in us. And, and, and the growth and the strength that he would bring to us in the midst of that. So it's okay. It's okay to try and fail. Don't be afraid, you know, to step out. Don't be afraid to step out uh, beyond your comfort zone. Um, the other thing, too, is, you know, you might kind of wonder, I kind of wonder, you know, this scenario is going on. You know, the other 11 disciples, they're in the boat. And they're plugging away at straining because the wind is contrary. And all of a sudden, when this encounter comes with Jesus, you know, everybody's going to stop rowing. At least you would hope so. <laughs> you know, let's take, let's take this opportunity. But, but, you know, I think some of us are kind of like, God told me to get in the boat, to go to the other side, and I'm putting my back into this thing, and I'm rowing. I'm rowing. I'm going to the other side, and that's where I'm headed. And it could have been very easy for maybe one of the disciples to say, you know, Peter, get back in the boat. Come on. We got to keep rowing here. You, you're slacking off, and the wind's blowing against us, and we're, we're, we're losing ground now. And, and we can do that, right? We can do that where it's like, if I don't keep doing what I've been doing, I'm going to lose ground. But the reality often happens. It's the opposite in circumstances like this. Here's an opportunity for all the disciples to have an encounter with the Lord, a new, a fresh encounter. And I find myself, you know, at times too, you, you get stuck again in this thing. We get stuck in the one thing that we've heard from God. And, and then we, we're just, we're focused on that so much that it's all of a sudden, hey, you know what? I need to take a break from this. I just, I need a fresh encounter with God so that I can be more effective in mending the nets. So I can be more effective in casting the nets and, and catching people for Jesus. Amen? So we, we need fresh encounters. And I, I really believe that's a part of the whole thing that Jesus created here when he first gave the, the disciples that vision to go to the other side get in the boat and go to the other side but all of a sudden in the midst of that he wanted them to see him in a new way a fresh way and encounter him because it was going to change how they moved on from that place there um i think there's three things i, I the, the beautiful thing here about peter's failure I think there's three things that happen uh, to me. One, the first thing that we see is he tries. He gets out and he tries. The second thing is he has a measure of success. I mean, the scripture specifically says he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But then it says he saw that the waves were boisterous and he began to sink. He took his eyes off Jesus, right? And that's that's the truth. We've all heard that before, right? We got to keep our eyes on Jesus because when we get our eyes onto the circumstances around us and all the troubles that started coming up, you know, that's when we start to sink. But Peter, you know, he tries and he has a measure of success. And then um, now he knows the third thing is he knows what he has to work on because Jesus catches him, pulls him up, you know, now Jesus is not only carrying his own weight on the water, he's carrying somebody else's, lifting him up, and they walk back to the boat together. 
But now Peter needs, and Jesus said to him, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Now, some of us might say, you know, Jesus, give the guy a break. I mean, he was willing to get out. Why are you giving him a hard time? You know, why are you being so hard on him? Saying, you know, you have little faith. Like he, he walked on the water more than all the rest of the disciples. But, you know, we can be sure of this, is that when God's speaking, when God's working, he's always doing it in love. He never does it in a wrong spirit. And, I mean, Jesus is love in motion, and that's been honestly, my own experience as I've walked in life and made my own share of failures is that he is love in motion. So when he says to Peter, oh, you have little faith, you know, he's saying to Peter what he needs to hear in that moment. He's saying what Peter needs to hear. You know, why did you doubt? Why, why did you take your eyes off of me? And if Peter hadn't have heard that, if he hadn't got out of the boat, went through that whole experience and heard that, then I'm certain that it would have shortchanged his growth and, and his walk in the Lord because that's where Peter was at. Maybe he was the only one willing to get out of the boat. Maybe he was a little bit further ahead in terms of, well, I, I don't know, but just painting the scenario here. But that, So that's what he needed to hear. If he, if he was going to go on, more than the other disciples, then that's what he needed to hear as a result of seeing his failure, that, okay, he had this much success. Now, if I'm going to go on from here, this is what I have to do. I got to work on my faith. I got to bump my faith up. And, you know, when, when, when somebody says something to you that hurts you, and I love in Proverbs uh, chapter 27 and verse 6. Uh, yeah, Brian's got that. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. You know, when somebody says something to you that hurts you, it doesn't always mean that they shouldn't have said it. And it, it took me a while to learn that because, but you know, sometimes people say things to us and, and it hurts, but you need to step back and you need to say, okay, like, did that hurt me because, you know, they said it in a, in a wrong spirit, in a wrong way, or did it hurt me because that's where I'm at and I need to make a change in that area? And that's what's happening here, I, re I really believe, with, with Jesus and Peter, is Jesus is saying something that's kind of, it seems like a stern word, but he's saying something to him that he needs to hear. And sometimes people say stuff to us that we just, we need to hear in that moment. And, and, and maybe they don't always do it perfectly, but if it's, if it's an area where we need to make a change, you know, then, then let's receive that. Let's learn to receive it. Let's not stop and think, well, that hurt me, which therefore means they shouldn't have said it. No. They said it because, and especially if it comes from somebody that you know cares about you. And Peter knew that Jesus cared about him. So faithful are the wounds of a friend. Amen? So they're in the boat heading to the other side. And, you know, um, symbolically, too, the boat speaks, um, it speaks about the church. Um, we are, you know, really, we're the modern-day Noah's Ark. Uh, this is the body of Christ, you know, just like um, Noah was to build a boat and get all the animals in it uh, for the saving of, of those of his wife and three sons and their three uh, daughter-in-laws. Um, you know, it's the same today. It's, it's like that today. This is, this, is, this is Noah's Ark, so to speak, right? And uh, I remember... Years ago, when uh, my oldest son Noah was about two years old, and he was riding with me in the tractor, and I made up this little rap song, and uh, <clears throat> it was kind of—it went like, um, "I said, hey Noah, are you going to get in the boat today? Jesus is the boat that makes you float when He washes all your sins away. So get on in, don't live in sin. You walk with Him, you're going to win, win, win. <laughs> Amen. <clears throat> so." 
All right. That might not hit the top 10 in the charts, but anyways, it was cute for my son at the time, right? But it's, it's true. It's like we're the modern-day Noah's Ark, right? We're, we're the body of Christ. We're the church, and, and we're calling people in. This is the place of safety from the world. And, um, but, you know, sometimes we're all here in, in, in the ark, and just like Pastor Travis is saying, you know, the mending of the nets, the casting, like there's stuff to do. And, you know, there's, if we're speaking, for example, uh, of Noah's Ark, there's eight people on the boat. And so maybe, you know, could we all help out with uh, preparing some meals? Because we got we to gotta eat, right? Um, we got animals on the boat. So, Yeah. I'll let you guys discern which one are the people and which are the animals in the boat. But anyways, but, you know, we got to feed the animals. So, hey, let's chip in and help out with feeding the animals. And, you know, after a while, it starts to smell. You know, maybe you could help us pitching a little bit of the poo over the boat. You know, like there's there's stuff to do. <laughs> and And that's just the reality of... With the way it was for Noah in the ark, and that's, that's the reality for us today, you know, in the body. There's, there's stuff to do, and, and God's giving all of us that opportunity to, to be a part in that, you know. And so I just want to encourage you this morning. If you're not plugged in somehow uh, here with us as a family, like maybe you're here, you're coming to church, and, and you're part of our family, but everybody needs to be doing something. Right? I mean, we already have Noah and Dustin there. One of them's taking out the recycle, and the other's uh, doing the garbage. And, and, you know, like they're not, they're, not, they're not riding the garbage truck down the road, thank God. But, uh, but they're taking the garbage out to the road, you know. Like we all have something to do. And, and it, it's a blessed opportunity that we all have to, to come in somehow. And, um, and just like... Pastor Travis was sharing last week about, you know, the connected and the committed. You know, we all want to be committed. We all want to be doing something because it all helps with the load of what we have to do. And, and not only that, but it also makes it more effective, right? Many hands make light work. And, and so it makes it more effective when we're all pitching in. So I just want to put that before you this morning. If, if you're here this morning and... Maybe you've been coming here for a year. Maybe you've been coming for, uh, what is it, it's been 16 years now since the, the birthing of this particular local body. And, uh, but, you know, get plugged in. Find out, find out, God, where can I serve? What, what can I do uh, to help this thing grow? Because God wants it to grow. Amen? God wants it to grow. God wants more to happen. God wants more people sitting here than are sitting here this morning. God, like I, I believe that, and I, I'm not, I'm not sold on mega churches, but it's not that. But it's just there's people out there who need the Lord, and when they come in, it's not just about them getting saved either. It's it's about them, you know, being trained up. It's about them learning how to grow. It's about them learning how to overcome things in their own lives too. Amen. And so that all takes people. It all takes time. There's there's no way that just a few people can do that. And so it's just, it's an opportunity we all have to work together. And um, yeah, you know, just coming back to <laughs> Noah's Ark scenario again, too. It's, it's like, and as we work together, um, sometimes there's some wrestle and some of that, too. You know, and, and again, that's just, that's part of the opportunity for us to all grow together. And uh, it's been sweet. I, I've just found that as much as the wrestles that have happened in just my um, small experience, too, in church leadership, not just here, but even the other church that I was part of before I attended here. But they've just been some of the things that brought the greatest amount of, of growth, you know, in my life. And so, you know, it's, it's as we learn to walk together and work together that, um, that the effectiveness and, and, the, and the growth and the beauty of what God is doing in, in all of our lives together, you know, not just individually, but even together 
it just becomes such a beautiful thing. So I just want to finish out with here. Uh, we know, um, so Peter gets back in the boat and, and uh, with the rest of them. And it says um, that when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And in John chapter 6, uh, it says that, and immediately they were at the land where they were going. Sometimes we take time out of straining at the oars and all that thing and to have a fresh encounter with the Lord, to always keep that fresh encounter, always keep our daily lives uh, all about having an encounter with Jesus, walking with Jesus in the midst of what we're doing. Yes, he told us to do it, but he wants us to do it with him. And sometimes when you take that time, you, you think you're actually losing time, but it actually makes you more efficient in what you're doing. And I think we see that here too. It's like, you know, they have this encounter with Jesus and then, whoa, all of a sudden he gets in the boat and they're immediately at the place where they were going. Now, that's not to say you're all of a sudden all going to be transported in the spirit somewhere. Uh, it did happen with Philip in the scripture too. But, um, but at the same time, it just speaks to all of us. There's an efficiency uh, that happens in our lives when we're doing these things with Jesus. And we also notice that, um, you know, when they willingly received him into the boat, that this happened. So it's just this willing reception. And then it says um, in Matthew chapter uh, 14, verse 33 there, then those who were with him in the boat came and worshiped him, saying, truly, you are the son of God. You know, I believe that true vision has to come out of true worship. And, you know, like Pastor Travis and I, like, you know, we're, we're just praying into, and Camilla and Anita and, and, and some of you that are involved in different ways, we're seeking, we're looking for vision. Hey, what's the next step? Where do we go from here? Uh, and, and if we're to, get, to go to there, how do we get to there? You know, what's, what's the strategy for getting there? And we pray into that. But one thing I've learned and one thing we see here is that true vision has to come out of true worship. You know, if we're not walking in those fresh encounters with God as we seek to move forward, as we seek to grow together, as we seek to expect great things from God, if we don't have fresh encounters, you know, that results in this fresh worship, then it's not going to birth true vision. And so we want true vision. You know, we want to be going where God wants us to go. But we want that to come out of, um, you know, out of that true worship and just having that fresh encounter with God, just recognizing just afresh in our daily lives that, Jesus, truly, you are the Son of God. You got me to the place where I am. Sometimes we forget, right? We, we all started our journey somewhere in the Lord, and... Some of us, maybe we were in drugs, it was alcohol. Maybe some of us were just caught up in lust. That was my testimony. You know, a huge struggle there. But God brought me out of that. You know, God brought us all out of something. And sometimes we just have to stop and just remember, wow, you know, God, this is, this is where you brought me from. This is what you've done for me, you know. And so, yeah, just God bless you guys. Just... Thank you for being here this morning. Thank you that you took the time to just come and stay in the ark, <laughs> you know. And thank you for, you know, the part that you guys play in helping get the meals ready and, and helping to feed the animals and, and uh, to deal with some of the stuff, you know. It's, um, you made the good choice, and we, we want to keep going on in that. Amen. So... I think I'll just finish with a word of prayer, and uh, maybe we'll have the worship team come up, and if you guys could just sing that song again, um, no, the, uh, the other song about the mountain, uh, you're never going to let me down, but anyways, you know that one, Don, Don knows what I'm talking about, amen, well, why don't you just stand with me, and uh, let's just commit our time to the Lord, and then we're going to have a little time of worship. Father, I just want to thank you this morning that it's okay with you. It's okay to try and fail. And 
Lord, this morning, we don't want to fail to try, but we just thank you that we can rest in you and that we can step out on things that we don't know. We can step out on things that we haven't done before and we can grow. God, we can grow. Even when we miss it sometimes, even when we fail, we just thank you that, Lord, your arms are um, so big and so strong to wrap around us and just to remind us again that you love us and that you're going to help us to get it right the next time. And even if we don't quite get it right, but we learn something and just move on. And, uh, Lord, we just bless you and we thank you for that this morning, Lord. Lord, we're just here right now. And we're just going to commit this time to you. We're going to just recognize that truly you are the Son of God and worship you.